protections of uh, uh, international um, finance and development policy. And of course, uh, my training as a macroeconomist, uh, you know, I have similar interests in different areas on, on overlapping areas of interest, I should say. So now this uh, is part of my ongoing research on global value chains, right? And, uh, you know, GVCs have become some kind of a buzzword in the last few years, even though it's nothing new. Uh, they've been with us for the last, I would say, uh, if you read some history about global value chains, you would go back to as far as 4,000 years ago, right? I mean, we have seen uh, different kinds of um, uh, you know, traders, uh, you, know, so, uh, you know, in modern day Turkey, 4,000 years ago, they imported luxury fabrics and, uh, and they made a barrel and then bronzes, and then they traded throughout this region, the region where I am here based right now. So, Global value chains are not new at all by any stretch of imagination, but then since the 90s, they have become very, very prominent in policy debates as many, many developing countries, uh, many emerging markets, they try to be part of this big globalization uh, wave that swept across the world. And by doing so, they were hoping to reap some significant development benefits, right? So anyways, that's the, the broad context is just, um, I, I'm very interested in these uh, issues that TVCs throw up and how different firms, different countries try to engage themselves internationally through trade, uh, through participation in GVCs. Now, now, what are the aspects that became fairly, uh, I would say, important in the last few years, and especially after COVID, uh, is about how disruptions to GVCs have, uh, you know, ha have played out and how has it affected many countries and uh, how firms have lost out and, and what is the role with digitalization and digital capabilities that uh, that can play a role in helping or or hindering firms participation. So this is like the broad background to where I'm coming from as far as this research is concerned. So now let me uh, give you a brief um, uh, you know overview of what I'm going to talk about today. And uh, this is of course uh, co-authored work with uh, a couple of my very good friends and collaborators. Of course, uh, one of them is based in King's College London, and the other one is in IIT Madras. So uh, I thank them for allowing me to present this as well today. Uh, well, so the, the title of the paper, of course, is Does Digitalization Enhance or Spur Global Value Chain Participation? So we are provi providing some firm level evidence uh, from a sample of uh, emerging market economies, right? So now, feel free to uh, ask any questions. I'll, I'll try and uh, take them uh, as, as it comes along or once I'm done with it, uh, the this is forthcoming in information economics and policy. So it was just recently accepted when I was trying to finalize uh, this lecture. And uh, if you are interested, please you can read the entire article from the web page. And it's actually open access, so we made it open access so that it actually reaches a lot more people. So I really hope that if you're interested in the topic, you would you would take a look at uh, the actual uh, full fledged article that's uploaded on the journal web page. Right? Okay. Now, like I said. Providing a little bit of context to what we are talking about here, even though GVCs have, are not really new, uh, even though they have been with us for like 4,000, 5,000 years, I think since the 90s, there have been a lot of transformative events that have put the global value chains in the radar, in the policy map, right? Uh, you had the integration of China and Eastern Europe into the global economy. Uh, you saw uh, a lot of trade agreements like NAFTA and Uruguay Round, et cetera. And then all these things happened in the in the 90s and so that really resulted in a significant advancement of trade spurred through the global value chains right now i will give you a brief definition of what we really mean by global value chains in the next slide but before i get there just to give you the larger context so there, there is a lot going on in uh, in the trade literature and one of the uh, phenomena that uh, most academic economists working in the trade policy space have paid attention to is the rising importance of gvcs right so in very simple terms how do we understand global value chains it's just it's not about made in one country any longer. It's involving fragmentation of production across countries 
across the value chain, right? I mean, if you're already familiar with it, I'm, I'm, uh, apologies for uh, you know talking about this in a very basic way, but it's just for those who are uh, not initiated into the topic, it, it just involves fragmentation of production across countries, right? And it's very intuitive to think about it, right? It's not like you are producing only one product in one country any longer, even to, if you take your iPhones, which are all over the world, you, you, every single part has is made across the world and they are all assembled in different countries. And finally, the product reaches is you. So we are living in a world where production is globalized and and it is fragmented across different countries. So different countries smell different opportunities based on what they are good at doing. And so it's no longer the fact that I can't produce the entire product by myself. It's a matter of what I'm good at, in, in a, even if it's a small part of a particular value chain, right? So that's where the whole idea of global value chains become significantly important. And all the more reason why COVID-19 was a very important shock, right? Because it did showed the interdependent nature of globalization of how countries are connected together. So it brings the good and the bad, but the whole point is you can't give up on this idea of being integrated just because you had such shocks, but it is also important to understand that because of such interlinkages, countries are vulnerable to such shocks, right? So this is the broader context. So now if you think about what has happened since the nineties, right? I mean, the last three decades or so, there's a lot of ICT developments, information communication technology. I mean, internet is all over the world right now. Uh, thanks to Zoom, we are connected globally. So there have there been a, a lot of strides in the ICT <laughs> space. And there have been more cost-effective and reliable telecommunications have come about. So all of this have coincided with many multinational firms uh, having to outsource very complex production activities right across different borders. So now, if you think at look at the basic data, just to give you the larger picture, about 60% of global trade today comprises of trade and intermediate goods and services, right? That are essentially happening at multiple levels of production networks for final consumption, right? So this expansion of GVCs across the world, uh, it involves both cross-border trade and cross-border foreign direct investment. They have come to occupy an extremely important position in understanding how countries are connected and integrated globally, right? So this, uh, like I mentioned very briefly when I started the presentation, this is also because there is a, an increasing consensus, right, amongst many economists, uh, many academic, careful academic studies and research that seems to point out that there are a lot of potential development benefits that countries can have. Right? I mean, what's your biggest policy question for a country when it's come to survival? How do I generate growth for my country, for my people? How do I develop? How do I move, move up the ladder, right? Income ladder, how can it be distributed uh, better? How can everybody participate in this process, right? This is, these are the fundamental existential questions, right? And so everything that we are talking about is connected to this overarching question. Now, if you are told that being part of this global value chain is one of the pathways through which you can achieve that, well, then everybody will you know, rightly and appropriately <laughs> jump into that bandwagon. And that's exactly what you see happen, right? So many countries with their ability to you know, specialize in different parts of the value chain, they try to generate you know, higher incomes, higher productivity gains, greater employment opportunities, poverty reduction and so on, right? I mean, this is a, a large uh, set of people working on many different aspects of this. And so uh, we are somewhere, you know, working on one tiny aspect of this, but it's a very important angle. But I'm just giving you the broad picture so you understand where uh, or why this topic is important. Why should you care about this as much as we do beyond just the public from a publication standpoint, it takes us immense policy significance, right? So that's the point. Now, um, but let, let me move to the next slide. I'll just show you something. So uh, before I move forward, just as I said, GVC is just about made in the world. It's just production is globalized and there are more formal definitions. Uh, you know, looks you know, tricky and convoluted, but the idea is still very simple. It just, a global value chain is just something that consists of series of stages involved in the production of any product, right? It can be a product or a service that's sold to us. And at every stage, each country or a firm adds value. Right? And we also know that it involves more than one country. Obviously the two stages produced in two different countries, right? So you can classify a firm 
as participating in a GVC if it at least produces one stage in a GVC. This is like a, one of the most widely accepted examples uh, I and mean definitions. Like say you take a bike that is assembled in Finland, it has parts coming from Italy, Japan, Malaysia, then it's exported to Egypt. Now that is a classic example of a GVC. You have many from big products, like think of commercial airliners like Boeing 777 aircrafts to something as small as a sharpener, a pencil sharpener, right? All of them have uh, are part of different kinds of value chains, right? So a country, a sector, or a firm can participate in a GVC if it at least engages in one stage in the production process, okay? Right, and um, if you look at the global trends, like I said, from the 90s, there have been a significant pickup, as you can uh, see from the broad data, the country level data. And then there's been a plateauing since the global financial crisis. Now, there are many different explanations that have been put forward as to why that is happening, uh, partly because there have not been major push events, like transformative events, like what happened in the 90s. Uh, China joining the WTO or, or Eastern European integration within the global economy, all of those happened in the 90s in a significant way that propelled this trend. But then after the global financial crisis, you haven't seen many landmark events that push forward uh, like GVC integration. In fact, some argue that the, this major push is over because countries have actually matured in terms of their um, participation. They started producing their own products at home, uh, China being one of the significant examples. So these, uh, there are many different explanations. We don't have to get into that right now, but the whole idea here is just to tell you that uh, until at least the global, global financial crisis, it was, uh, you know, cat catching a lot of attention, attracting a lot of attention. Right. But after that, there's been a plateauing. And especially with COVID, there was a significant disruption. Right. So now the future is yet to be seen. We don't know where there's going to be a resurgence, where things are going to go back. So this is the larger context in which we come in with our research in this paper. Now, most of this advancement in global value chains have occurred in tandem with ICT uh, penetration, right? I mean, so there has been a development of uh, information communication technology revolution in general, and, and we all understand that they have happened side by side, okay? But the question really is that, are they necessarily associated with each other? I mean, we can see some correlations, as you can see from this uh, simple uh, country level scatter plot that is uh, suggesting higher broadband subscriptions, higher internet product uh, uh, penetration, and then higher global value chain participation, you see that there is a fairly decent uh, fit in terms of how they are correlated. But the question still remains whether this is actually suggesting a causal relationship. And if it is, then how exactly would we understand that, right? So there is uh, very little systematic empirical evidence documenting this connection, okay? Between firms' attempts to digitalize and their participation in GVCs. So notice, I set the context about the importance of GVCs and why countries want to plug in. Then you na naturally you shift it to the firm level because firms are the ones who are obviously participating in these production processes, right? So we now focus on the firm level. And now we want to understand when firms are trying to plug themselves into GVCs, what are the determining factors? I mean, what matters? Culture matters, institutions matter, uh, productivity matters, financial constraints matter, or uh, basic, something as basic as having an internet connection or the basic digital infrastructure, to what extent each of these factors can provide an oomph right, to, the, to the firms to plug themselves into GVCs. Seems very basic uh, and intuitive, right? It's obvious to many of us that, well, of course, internet matters. Why should I write a paper about this? Well, the answer is that it's not that simple. I mean, it, it seems very simple and intuitive, but there's not much systematic evidence that have been that has been documented uh, connect, bringing out the relationship between the two right and uh, granted this is not the only thing that matters and we are not making that case we are just saying that let's try and understand to what extent this digitalization or the whole process of having something very basic as a, a firm's own website or using emails for communication to what extent does that allow GVCs to participate, I mean, firms to participate in these global value chains, right? Now, if you look at some uh, excellent country studies, like for example, if you look at the literature, right? Uh, uh, say 
take the case of Rwanda and uh, the tea sector, right? Uh, one, of the, one of the very nice papers written by Foster and Graham, they talk about how digitally mediated exchange underlines the economic exchange and how it has significant effects in the way Rwanda firms were interacting, right? So how it helps them put them, plug them into GVCs, right? Now, the digital infrastructure can certainly facilitate firms to participate in GVCs, right? But they also note that such effects can favor only the big firms, right? Many small and medium enterprises, again, SMEs are the backbone of many economies these days. And, and if this effect is so biased towards the larger firms, then there is a policy problem, right? Many economists have highlighted that this is something that policymakers have to pay attention to. You don't want to be um, stuck in a situation where you are obviously favoring only the larger firms or providing an ecosystem that benefits only the larger firms, right? Obviously, that's not, um, that goes against the principles of equality. And so we want to be able to have a more um, egalitarian perspective in mind, right? So now keep all of that in mind. Um, you, you look into the literature closely, you realize that the importance of internet connectivity uh, to these firms in specific sectors, they have, been, they have been documented, right? But then you don't have much in terms of a cross-country comparison uh, at the firm level. Right? We're not really aggregating things at the country level, but you want to have uh, to be able to facilitate a cross-country comparison. If you're going to be so micro and say it works only in Rwanda, in Africa, then that means it does not work in the neighboring country, then there is a problem. So you want to be able to generalize this finding to a larger set of countries to be able to conclusively say that there is a strong uh, association or at least a uh, a suggestive causal relationship between the two and the uh, policies can be devised in such a way that you can focus on getting the basics right. Yeah. The basics being set up the digital infrastructure that will allow mm -hmm. these firms to actually participate in global value chains. Right. So this is what you are, we were trying to get at when we started working on this paper. And we looked at the literature and we realized that there's not much that uh, has been done in, in, this, in this front. So we use this as our uh, motivation, the basis for the, uh, for the paper, right? Okay. Now, uh, what, what else has been done in the academic literature, if you look at it? Well, it, it relates to two uh, tangential streams of uh, you know, interest of, of strands of stu studies, right? In the, in, the, in the literature. If you look at it, on the one hand, people are, are interested in understanding what drives countries to participate in GVCs. That's the overarching question, right? Uh, what will allow you to, or what will help you to uh, participate in different tiers? So you can think it's natural if I am good at producing something, I will plug myself. But well, you know, you need more than just the fact that you're good at something. So how <laughs> would you, what are the factors that determine or that allow you to be that way, right? Get, get to that point. So that's uh, part of the uh, research question that you want to understand what are the determining factors. So that's one, right? Now, in this in this strand of literature, many, many, many papers have tried to, I mean, it's actually it's upcoming literature. It's not really that established, but people have looked at the country level, at the firm level, country case studies. They've come up, come up with many different macroeconomic or institutional factors that allow a country to be successful in being plugged into the global value chains, GVCs, right? So that's one set of studies. So this, our study can relate to one uh, subset of this study, uh, this, this strand. And the other stream is about um, understanding the broader societal or social and economic impacts of ICT, right? Uh, ICT in emerging and developing economies. What is the nexus between, uh, say, information technology or ICT and macroeconomic outcomes, right? So it says growth, productivity, both at the country level and the firm level, right? I mean, uh, how, to, how do you understand the link between the two? So we are trying to bring these two, engage ourselves with these two strands of literature, but trying to make um, a fresh and a unique contribution to our understanding of this issue, right? One of the things to just uh, give you a preview of the, the, the punchline before we get to the end is that we are uh, extending this in a novel way, this, this understanding of this literature by classifying firms into multiple layers of specialization, right? So it's not just a binary classification, whether you are plugged into GVCs or not, right? Whether you're a GVC firm or a non-GVC firm. So what we are doing is we are actually grouping them into four distinct categories. And um, 
the, the four distinct categories would be like firms that participate, that are deeply involved, that they are just participating at the peripheral level, or firms that are exporting, but they are not involved, and purely domestic firms, right? So this level of finer uh, categorization of GVCs would actually provide, uh, uh, you know, at least we believe that it, it has a richer <clears throat> insight to come up with. And so we, we use that uh, with the available data constraints in mind, we managed to come up with this finer classification and try and see how this, um, uh, how digitalization affects firms in these different categories, right? So what, how, what is the impact of digitalization on firms with different degrees of integration into this value chains, right? The global value chain. So this is what uh, one of the things that we try and do in our, our paper, and that's uh, part of our value addition that we actually tackle. Now, there are a lot of technicalities I can go into. If you're interested, I'm very happy to talk about those things, but I'll, in the interest of keeping it at least, um, you know, broadly digestible and not sound too pedantic and boring like a classroom lecture. I'll try not to get into too much of the econometrics, but I'm sure many of you are well versed with the empirical skills that needed em empirical uh, results and the economic <laughs> models that are attached to these kind of studies. But I'm happy to talk about that in detail later on. But let me give you a flavor of what we have done. And, and then I will walk you through the results and the contribution and, uh, and some of the policy significance that comes out of uh, our study. And then, and then I'm happy to answer any questions you have and we'll take it from there. I, I hope uh, that, Dr. That's, uh, Savitharan, I just uh, yeah. interfere just a moment, please. Please, no problem. Uh, all the audience are requested to mute their mics. Uh, one Dr. Sarji, I guess, he, his mic is unmute. So please take care of it. Please, uh, because we all are getting disturbed because of somebody's mic is unmuted. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Hastur. Dr. Yeah. Dr. Okay. Sarji, please, please mute your mic. Can anybody else facilitate and talk to him because he may not be understanding English very well or he is not, uh, but he is with the mic. Yes, thank you. Please go ahead. Thank you. All right. Thank you. Thank you so much. So um, as I was uh, trying to say that, so what we are trying to do in this paper was that understand this connection between digitalization and global value chains, and we focus on the firm level, right? Now, what is EMDE that you see in the slide? It's just emerging markets and developing economies. Essentially exclude all high income countries, focus on the poorer regions and the emerging regions as defined by the World Bank. And we will just look at the firm level data set that they have put together when I mean, we use their source data and then we come up with our own um, you know, analysis using the data, right? So like I also mentioned, our main deviation from the current set of studies or current trends in the literature is to add the GDC dimension more explicitly and test out the relationship between these two uh, uh, trends or phenomenon that's happening side by side, right? Now, on the econometrics of it, like I said, we correct for endogeneity issues. Uh, firms could self-select into uh, you know, being more digitalized firms could automatically, those who are participating in GVCs are already very uh, you know, upfront with their ICT skill sets or ICT endowments. And then we also possible that um, firms, it is not that the digitalization is resulting in participation of, in GVCs, but it's the other way around. There could be possibilities like this that, that have to be addressed when you're uh, writing uh, such empirical papers and you have to provide, go to extensive lengths to prove that the, the onus is on us to prove that this is not driven by spurious considerations. And so we have done that extensively in this paper. We have provided a lot of robustness checks by using a variety of techniques to show that our basic results hold, right? Now, if you actually think about the overall um, idea uh, how these articles get published and, and what, what are the, one of the main uh, themes that come out in these refereeing process and what we do is establish a basic result, right? Based on theory and solid footing and you ex establish that this is what we find. And then 
go to extensive length to prove that this result is not just by chance, right? So whatever I do to the data, whatever I do to the model, whatever I introduce as a substitute, it still gives me this solid fundamental result that I came up with in step one, right? So this is what we have done. And again, like I said, for greater detail, please go through the paper and I'm happy to talk this through if you have any questions, but uh, so that's just to give you a brief preview, all right? Okay, then what else do we do apart from looking at the basic connection between firms digitalization attempts and how it affects their GVC participation. So this is step one. This is what we're looking at, right? Now, the, what's the second thing that we're looking at? Well, then what happens to financial constraints? We know that the, there, is, there are some case studies and studies like in Rwandan case, et cetera, that such digital adoption favors only the big firms, not the small and medium enterprises. So are the SMEs being left out? Can those SMEs which have financial constraints, can this be overcome uh, if, if digitalization can help, uh, if, you, if you get onto this digital bandwagon, would you be able to overcome your financial constraints in such a way that it will enhance your GVC participation? So that's a natural extension of what we are trying to do. And there's something that we try and address in this paper. And we also want to understand the, the differences between how the digitalization affects uh, large firms and small firms in general, and what are the implications, okay? So this is, this is like the basic idea of what we have tried to address in uh, our paper, okay? Now, why do I have this slide on? Review just because we don't have to go through each of the other tables, but just to give you a basic sense of um, what we have found and how we have gone about the paper. Right, so I'll give you the punchline again. Starting the basic idea is that we have found that digitalization very, very strongly enhances firms' ability to participate and integrate into global value chains. Right, so that is like the most fundamental result we established. I will explain exactly how we define GVCs and how we define digitalization in a very basic sense in the next couple of slides. But this is your overall um, uh, highlighted, hi highlighting the result that we get from this uh, from, from our empirical analysis. Okay, so that's one. Now, what else uh, do we find? We find that so firms that adopt digitalization are highly likely, like say six to ten percent more uh, likely to participate in GVCs. We also find that. Um, for financially constrained firms, digitalization matters. And we also find that those advantages associated with internet adoption actually extends to SMEs, which is again significant from a policy perspective, right? Finally, we also add a little bit of evidence. We show that how this digitalization process, again, allows firms to, from smaller agglomerates, right? So I mean, if you use, you look at economics, economic geography literature, you talk about agglomeration effects, smaller firms with smaller agglomerates and bigger agglomerates. So the question is whether the, the smaller ones benefit in this process. And so we, we find that this benefits extend to the smaller agglomerates and not just confined to larger agglomerates. So these are, again, uh, extensions of the basic idea of how uh, digitalization affects GVC participation of firms. And then you're looking at some conditional factors and probe them more carefully to see whether they also are consistent in your arguments about how this affects um, the smaller firms, et cetera. Okay. So this is what we have done. Now, how do we go about um, how do we go about uh, defining this and what is the data source and what's the model and what's the uh, mechanism through which we achieve these results, we establish these results. First, for those, again, who work in the space, World Bank Enterprise Survey is a very, very uh, useful database in this context because they have, they conduct standardized, harmonized surveys across about 140 countries in the world and at the firm level, right? It's random sample, uh, stratified random sampling, and they, they just, you know, uh, constructed by location, size, et cetera. There's a lot of information out there. There are several papers that utilize this uh, public good, which is, and it's available for free. It's not proprietary. So you can download it and you can take a look at in your own country, even by country, it's available. You can do a cross-country analysis like what we have done. You can focus on specific countries if you're interested. And it goes into different geographic regions within country. So it's a quite a, a well-established database, okay, for those of you interested in firm level research. And it is not the this is not the only thing that can be done. It has aspects of corruption, has aspects of many other dimensions at the firm level are captured in this database, right? So 
financial constraints is one aspect trading is another aspect like what so we have used this information from the database but if you're interested in other angles like uh, gender participation everything to do with you know the sustainable development goals at least partly uh, you can uh, you can actually derive from this data set okay so it, it's a useful resource now they survey uh, both the manufacturing and the service sector, and then they have a standard questionnaire. Analysis begins from 2006. So you have a very reasonable time, um, time period to do the analysis from. And we also cannot construct a panel data as uh, because of the, the, the repeated cross-sectional nature of the data set. So we just put together for 52 countries uh, because the same firms are not surveyed every year. They are different. And so we have to utilize this as a repeated cross-section. But anyway, that's just a minor point. So in total, we have about 25,000 firms cut across 50 countries and for about more than uh, 12, 13 years or so, okay? So this is what we uh, have, it's our data set and it's, it's a big data set, right? Now, how do we uh, come up with the global value chain definition? At the country level, you have a lot of uh, established data sets again, which talk about GVC participation of the country on the whole. But as you very well know and understand, GVC is a firm level phenomenon, right? I mean, I'm not saying it cannot be done at the country level, but uh, the firms participate in GVCs, which is again aggregated at the country level, right? So if you go down to the firm level, you essentially want to identify those firms that are participating in the global value chains. How do we do that? Well, you have to be an importer and exporter simultaneously, right? So this is like a significant um, improvement over the existing studies uh, in, the, in, the, in the literature. But this goes to the heart of the definition of GVCs, right? So a firm that exports and imports simultaneously, it's not just one or the other, but you do two together, right? So that's essentially the heart of, again, the definition of GVCs, right? And then you can have an even more, uh, even narrower definition of GVCs. Like you can add, let's say firms that are importing and exporting two-way traders simultaneously. And they also have an internationally recognized quality certification. Right? That's a much narrower uh, you know, definition for GVCs as such, because it's not easy to find such firms because they have to match up to those, that standards. Okay? So if you, uh, there, there, is, there are studies which uh, define GVCs this way. So we have relied on the, we've surveyed this literature on firm level literature on GVCs, which already is very small and just growing. And we have looked at how for different studies have defined it. We have taken the most restrictive definition and um, in the, to, to the spirit of the definition of GVC and trying to see whether our uh, understanding of digitalization is uh, helping these firms, you know, increase participation in GVCs is actually holding up to such conservative measures, right? So it, it's easy to take the, the loose, uh, most, uh, you know, liberal measure out there, which could possibly always be uh, the positive in this instance, but you don't want to do that because you want to go for a much more uh, comprehensive definition of GVCs, right? So the, the reason why I say that is, is because this is, the definition of GVCs cannot be inconsistent with the idea that a firm is producing a good will involve two countries, at least two countries. So it makes them two-way traders. And so that, that's why you have to focus on firms that export and import simultaneously, all right? Okay. And like I said, the restrictive definition is adding the internationally recognized uh, quality certification. And this can be derived from the World Bank Enterprise Survey data, all right? Okay, now, uh, most of the studies have either focused on just the exporting aspects or just the importing dimensions, but they have not really looked at both aspects because it is important for backward integration and forward integration, right? Now, uh, what about the digitalization angle? Now, here is uh, the tricky part, right? When we think about digitalization, we think about blockchain, uh, you know, a lot of sophisticated ways in which you can capture ICT revolution that is happening around us. But what about the most basic digital infrastructure, let's say the internet, right? Well, do you have any high-speed internet connection? There's a huge digital divide in developing economies. It might sound um, ridiculous at this day and age to talk about not having an internet connection, but that is the truth. They're facing many developing countries. I mean, there is a lot of digital divide and that is not definitely acting as a impediment or a constraint to firms participating and reaping the benefits. So it is important to go down to the basics, right? So we focus on the most basic digital infrastructure because that is also 
partly constrained by the data set that we have. It's not that we don't want to use more advanced measures, but we have data only on the basic measures, but that is still a very good indication of whether that matters or not, right? And you do find in our sample, if you look at the descriptive stats, you do find that there, are, there is a lot of firms, there are a lot of firms which do not even have basic access to the internet at that point. So a use of internet, uh, you know, we all know that it allows firms to reduce uh, the dependence on middlemen. We know that faster and better information uh, is also available through internet access. And of course, we know that the use of internet allows for cost-effective and uh, time-effective cross-border interactions, right? So, I mean, these are all standard reasons. I mean, I don't have to convince you the importance of internet as this whole lecture is happening because of a stable internet connection. But from a firm's perspective, I think it matters a lot. And if they're especially looking at engaging themselves with the rest of the world, I think it matters to have a stable uh, internet, uh, internet connection, right? So that's one. And whether they have their own website, Right, they have. Uh, this is one of those uh, in issues, and we can also talk about high-speed connection, like I said. And there are two or three other robustness measures we try. So now there is uh, a small set of uh, studies which talk about how all these uh, factors matter in the firm's uh, productive activities and make them more productive, make them more engaging. So we use those, and we also, like I said, try to see whether firms have their own emails to communicate with clients or suppliers. So all those are. Uh, whatever is available out there as digital measures we have taken, but it is still coming under the broad umbrella of basic digital infrastructure. Okay, so this is the whole list that you have on the different GVC um, uh, definitions. So we are using simultaneous importing exporting. We also use the same with a quality certification. Then we have used two digital measures. One is a website and high-speed internet. Uh, and then you have a standard set of controls, right? You know, size of the firm matter, productivity of the firm matters, uh, to how young or how old is the firm in the process, and uh, whether they are, what about the ownership and about their credit constraints, right? So all of this, we have tried to uh, incorporate in a, in a full-fledged model, and we are trying to ask the basic but simple um, uh, but important question, whether your uh, participation in global value chains is influenced by your digital adoption strategies, or whether your digitalization attempts to, will allow you to plug yourself better, okay? So now, um, then the rest is all just, numbers and uh, charts and giving you some results. So let me go through some basics and giving you the flavor of the results. And then probably we'll talk about what could be possible extensions, some of the interesting policy angles that come out from this and I will end there, right? So uh, in, uh, in standard, uh, you know, econometric uh, terminology, we use a probit model because obviously the, the nature of our dependent variable is whether a firm is a two-way trader or not. So it's a binary dependent variable. So given that we are limited by the choice of what we can use in terms of our identification uh, strategy, the econometric model. And then of course, digitalization is our focal variable of interest. And then we have our vector of control variables, right? So now, uh, again, how do we deal with reverse causality or endogeneity issues that could be problematic in such uh, regressions. Well, like I said, we have used an extensive uh, use of instrumental variables. This is what the literature generally uses. And so what kind of instruments can we use to uh, talk about, you know, to, to make sure that GV, the, the association doesn't run from GVC participation to digitalization? rather than the other way around, right? Remember, we are talking about how digitalization affects GVC participation. But if you are going to say that if GVC participation is driving digitalization, we have a problem in the way we have set up the model. And so we have to prove or provide uh, some convincing arguments about how this could be addressed. And so we have done that using different instruments. And how do we do that? So one of the examples I can, I can sh uh, share with you is that we have taken the industry um, uh, average of, of this particular uh, of the, uh, the firm. So for example, if you use the industry average of the internet adoption, website adoption or high-speed adoption, then you exclude that particular firm's own use of the website as a possible instrument, right? And why do you do that? Well, the logic is that uh, if you do that, then firms that use digitalization more actively, then it will, if, if it is increase their GVC presence more than the sector's average, then the firm will be more exposed to the sector-wide advances, right? So then it is the spillover effect that 
matters behind this identification strategy. Okay, so uh, you can then incorporate the rest using sector fixed defects, etc. Right. So now. This is again, there is not that it is without problems. There are issues with it. If, if the trends are similar within the industry, then there is still could be an endogenous issue here, but this is the best we could find, at least as a baseline uh, measure, we start with this, okay? And then we have another instrument, for example, alter alternative, think about, um, let's say, a firm's training to its employees, okay? Now, why does it matter? And why should it be an instrument for ICT adoption? Well, the, uh, the rationale again is that if firms are providing formal training to their employees, it signals the possibility that the firm is already using ICT in its operations, right? It's not a stretch to assume that. Now, the need for training then comes from the firm's motive to further improve its ICT adoption, right? So if it provides training, then it improves its quality uh, and probably indirectly it can actually help the firms plug into GVCs, but the existing literature does not really document a direct channel effect here. So what we really uh, thought was it's a po possible instrument to address this endogeneity issue, right? So anyway, this is just two examples of what we could do about how to address the reverse causality issue. And what do we find? Again, just focus on these first two uh, rows. You see both website and high speed. Basically about seven to 10, per, uh, eight percent is in the, in the range of that, so which means Firms that have their own website, like their own digitalization attempts, are 8% or 7% more likely to be plugged into GVCs, which is really the economic significance is um, important here. It's not just the stars that you see because it's significant relationship and positive, but it also matters in terms of the magnitude, right? And these are all marginal effects because of the probit um, estimation. And now if you look at the uh, IV results, the economic significance is actually larger, right? Because after controlling for endogeneity, you see that the, the, um, the, the magnitude seems to be higher, okay? So again, the whole idea of uh, showing you these two tables is just to, to establish the basic point that whichever way we go at it, we still find that the digitalization attempts tend to enhance GVC participation or enhance the probability or likelihood of these firms being plugged into GVCs in higher, okay? So that's one. Now, uh, you can ask whether uh, these firms self-select uh, into, into being into GVCs and firms who already have a higher level of digitalization end up being part of GVC. So this is where the self-selection issue becomes important. We have a way to tackle that, we, we, what we call as propensity score matching. You can do that. You construct basically a group of firms which are similar to these firms, like a treatment group and a control group. And basically they are, all the characteristics are the same except the, for the uh, participation in GVCs, right? So then the question is, all the observables are matched. And after you match in terms of your productivity, size, age, and everything, the matching of the treatment and the counterfactual group is, you know, can be done using what we call as propensity scores. And then you use that to understand whether this relationship still holds, okay? So we do find that our results are robust, right? So this is the, the point. Now, the most important angle, again, like I said, is to look at this different degrees of integration. And we also find that our results go through for more uh, uh, the, the, the firms that are extensively plugged into GVCs and those which are in the peripheral, uh, but not for those which are not part of GVCs at all, right? So. All these are different um, uh, results pertaining to our baseline results, uh, focusing on the fact that uh, whichever definitions we use in terms of digitalization, whatever be the definition we use for firms participation in global value chains, both these tend to give you uh, so a strong positive associative relationship here, right? And we have proved that, or at least to a reasonable degree, we have eliminated concerns, econometric concerns by instrumenting them in different ways, okay? Now, the extensions in terms of credit constraints. Again, we see that if your, um, you know, there's a very small literature that has identified that firm's participation, um, you know, can be deterred because of credit constraints, right? So we tease out these connections in a, in a more explicit way, and we find higher credit constraints obviously are obstacles to participate in GVCs as signaled by your negative sign on the credit constraints coefficient. Then we also have digitalization on its own tends to spur GVC participation, which is consistent with the results we've established so far. So these two independent results are consistent with logic and the literature. Now, 
what we want to do is to look at the two interactive effects, right? Jointly, when you put the two together, meaning the eco, the web, the high speed or website or any kind of digitalization variable and credit constraint, do you see a positive uh, effect on the participation in GVCs? And that's exactly what we see. So what is it suggesting? It is suggesting that the as the extent of financial constraints faced by these firms go up, right? So if they embrace digitalization in their operation, then that allows them to enhance their participation in GBCs. That's exactly what we needed to see in the results and that's what comes out. So they are quite consistent with what we hypothesized earlier. So firms that are, that are facing higher credit constraints, mostly SMEs, for example, they benefit from the adoption of digital infrastructure because of greater efficiency in communication, operation, et cetera, and that allows them to be beneficiaries by being part of the global value chain, right? So I guess it's uh, getting a bit boring to keep repeating this at some, at some stage, but I'm trying to, what I'm trying to drive at here is that the basic idea that digital infrastructure matters for most firms, small and large alike. And it, it's incredibly important for small firms in actually helping them be part of the value chain uh, and, and they can benefit from being part of the value chain is something that has been overlooked. And we are trying to like establish that using many different ways. I have just run through these uh, tables because it's again, repeating the same story uh, with different uh, methods and uh, the extensions are also promising. And as I said, we have used different alternatives in terms of uh, definitions for GVCs and digitalization. And we even tried a panel data analysis, but it's a very small sample, unfortunately, because we don't really have um, a, a consistent time series of the same firms being surveyed every year, but whatever we managed to do, we did that. And with all of those things, we still find the basic results hold. okay? So to wind up uh, what I have been uh, trying to say for the last uh, 45, 50 minutes is that we know that the digitalization matters for firms GVC participation, something that the literature has not established conclusively and systematically. And we tried doing that in this paper. It's of course, it's not free from limitations and I'll touch upon the limitations as well, which is actually uh, paving the way for future research. Okay, so that's so one of the things to keep in mind. Now, uh, the what are the other conclusions we find? Apart from that, we also have, uh, you know, all the econometric considerations aside, we find that it helps SMEs and uh, and SMEs that are credit constrained more importantly, right? Because this is something that we need to focus on because many, many developing economies are placing their bets on small and medium enterprises and how they can uh, integrate them into this development process, right? Many micro and small and medium enterprises. In fact, that's MSMEs is very uh, the accepted usage. And it's not just in devel developing countries, emerging markets, but everywhere SMEs have a very important role to play. And I think, uh, if there is a pathway for them to be integrated into this process, then the policies should be framed and de uh, de developed accordingly. So this is one of those things that come out from our um, our results. Okay, and uh, we also find that they are, they are basically economically significant. It's not just a, a mindless, uh, you know, a statistical or econometric exercise that shows up some results, but they seem to have some economic significance as well. Right. So now. Despite all this uh, multiple measures, been to be, we have to be um, academically honest about you know, what could be done better to see if this could uh, uh, be improved in the future. We have some, some limitations for sure, for some owing from the nature of the data set that we have, but it is important to nevertheless recognize that so that we, uh, we understand how we can improve this as we move forward, right? Now, for example, many, um, SMEs are part of global value chains in an indirect way. Think about small firms supplying to larger, larger MNCs or larger firms in their own countries. And then those countries are, those firms are plugged into the value chain. So there is no direct connection. They are not really left out, but they are connected through the larger firms in terms of the network, right? So then how do we account for that? We cannot do that simply with the data that we have. It's a major constraint, but it is special, uh, especially relevant in our context. So if you have such data, even at the country level, uh, for, uh, whatever research you're doing allows you to capture those dimensions, that will be a very useful value addition supplement complement to, uh, to this, uh, to this finding and to this piece of research, right? So that's one of the things that uh, we could, we could think of in the future, if that data is made available, right? Now, 
second, in, uh, even though we have tried to uh, capture the spirit of GVCs through the data that we have, it still is not granular enough. Right? So there is a, uh, you know, where is the source of inputs coming from and how is it used? Right? So this is a very basic question for a firm trying to be part of a value chain. So that sort of fine data at the firm level, at the country level, at the product level is not really available yet. Maybe it is in process in many different countries are trying to come up with such uh, data, but that will, if you identify that, then you can construct finer measures of global value chains. And so that would allow you to enrich the results and, um, and policy insights from such studies could be even more important. And we don't have that. So that is one of the things. And finally, um, we would say, um, I mean, I, I would like to point out that the nature of digitalization itself is transforming. As we all know, it's not, I mean, it starts from internet, but you are talking about in the supply chain context, you're talking about say, how do firms uh, manage their warehouses, right? So think about what happened during the COVID crisis uh, when supply chains were massively disrupted. Part of it was about information was lost. Um, the information was not uh, transmitted through borders quickly and uh, how kind of what kind of management of uh, your inventory stocks in the warehouse all of that could have been digitalized all of it could have been using blockchains or whatever uh, uh, you know technology out there but where is the uh, the data on such advanced information processing tools and other kinds of supply chain related aspects and so these are uh, important when you are talking about digitalization in the umbrella because you have to unpack these effects so what we have managed to do is just barely scratching the surface because we have just looked at the basic digital infrastructure but do you possibly have uh, more sophisticated ways of actually dealing with it? And if you do that, then perhaps you probably have a much more convincing case at hand. Okay, so um, I think that is all I have uh, from my end. I hope uh, I had some, have said something useful, and I hope um, uh, you all uh, you know enjoyed the presentation. So thank you very much. And if you have any questions, uh, feel free to come. Uh, let me know and uh, and okay. Let me see. I, I I will look at the chat box right now. Uh, predictions in the context. Uh, well, um, uh, thank you for that uh, question. Uh, I I mean not as part of this project, but this is a work in progress as I mentioned earlier, and that's a wonderful uh, pathway for future research. And I I not quite familiar with the um, data sets available specifically to on in Ukraine and uh, what is going on right now. And this is a very, very pressing topic at this point in time. And I completely understand the importance um, and, and your question is absolutely important in this context. And that's something that I would love to engage more and look into more closely. And maybe we can uh, talk um, in flying as to how to take this forward and uh, we'll see if this this could how this could benefit uh, Ukrainian firms and how we can actually talk talk about it right I mean I'm, but as part of this research uh, I don't think we have such data unfortunately but it is definitely something to look into much more carefully and if you do have any leads I mean this is again open call for everyone here who's interested in this topic and if you do have such uh, you know a background or overlapping research interest you know please I'm all ears to listen to your um, you know um, thoughts about it and how we can take this collaboration forward I mean always more the merrier in terms of uh, public goods and research and so let's let's make the place um, the world a better place and so through our, whatever we can do so yeah that's that's my um, quick response to that question and I don't have a direct answer right now but it will be something that I'll be interested in looking into yeah so thank you thank you for that yeah Ah, oh, Vesna. Thank you. Um, apply for firms. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yes. The answer is yes, we can do that. And in fact, uh, uh, again, this is something that could even be possible uh, with the, uh, the WBS uh, survey that we have. Uh, if you can look at country level and then if you look at, so the two ways in which I can think of very broadly, I mean, so one, we can go directly to the input output tables, looking at uh, the food processing industry, and that, that must be from a different data set. Uh, we can do that. Or from the World Bank Enterprise Survey itself, we can try and do something of that kind, uh, basing uh, uh, you know, this, this sort of analysis based on the industry classification. We can arrive at the narrow it down to the food processing industry because you have industry level classifications, right? So what we have done is we have 
taken a very agnostic position when it comes to the industries. We've taken firms because we want to ma maximize the dimensions and, and leverage all the uh, uh, observations that we have in terms of the data points. But you can do com combine them into different bins in terms of industries. And so food uh, processing, sustainable agriculture, all of these are absolutely important topics. And this can be derived from such, uh, such data sets. So if you look at the WBES, you will be able to see the firms sampled from this industry. And then using this similar framework, you can actually uh, filter that and I can do that. Yeah. Yeah, uh, absolutely. Uh, I'm, I'm, my website, my all my details are available uh, on the website. And uh, I also shared the presentation with uh, the host and Dr. Hasrat. So if you're interested, please, please feel free to write to me. Um, and we will, I mean, we're just finishing up the semester over here and uh, we're heading into the uh, uh, summer break. So yeah, we, uh, I'll be happy to discuss future collaborative prospects as, as uh, if you're interested. So thank you very much for your interest. And uh, uh, yeah, so so any, any other uh, questions I can help you with or anything, comments or any criticisms, I'm happy to listen to. Uh, if not, Dr. Hasrat, I think I'm, uh, I'm, uh, I'm returning the floor back to you. Thank you for this opportunity to engage with uh, wonderful sort of people. And thank you for allowing me to uh, present some of my ongoing research. So thanks for the invitation once again, and I hope you found it beneficial. So let me know if I can um, um, talk about anything or I can help you with anything. Thank you, thank you so much, yeah. Yes, any other question? Any question, you can write in the chat box or you can speak right away. Okay, mm, there are a couple of things I like to share. Sometimes the... Please. Yeah. It's not related to your lecture. <laughs> your lecture is really very wonderful and it's very, very in-depth, yes. Um, although economics is not at all my subject, so I it's really very, very hard to comment anything on, but... In general, what I have observed is, is very, very in-depth. You have touched the econometrics, you have touched this uh, global value chain in a context of the uh, larger business. Uh, and of course, you have collected the primary data and then you have given the analysis. And moreover, it's... Um, very, uh, very great thing that you have already published this paper in a very highly reputed journal uh, in the world and it is open access that can be available to the readers whosoever is interested to read it. So uh, these are all all value additions, in fact, <laughs> to your <laughs> To, to your lecture and the knowledge you have provided. In addition to that, these are value added things can be um, can are the advantageous and the, the audience not only all of us whosoever are present in the lec in this lecture but largely because this recorded video uh, videos of our lectures are put into the public domain on the youtube and uh, today's lecture is put on the web tomorrow the next day we upload on the video uh, YouTube and then we circulate among all the uh, registered participants of this particular lecture. We circulate the link of the YouTube and uh, the presentation. For example, your presentation will also be put on this web page. And to the knowledge of everyone, we have the web page for each of the lectures and the elaborate information about the speaker, the lecturer, speaker, and uh, about the lecture, the brief introduction, I mean, uh, the abstract of the lecture is, is available on this with all, uh, with the basic details of the speaker, the email, the affiliation, the publications, etc everything is on the web page so we suggest and we request the everyone to visit that web page 
and that web page is also linked with the zoom so when you open the zoom and you try to register yourself so you see there is a link there is an abstract of this particular lecture and then there is a link and that link goes to the website link so there all details are uh, placed and after this lecture everything will be uploaded so this is all available in the public domain so um, i think uh, it is it is added value to all the audience and um, the other other people who want to access this so we we are also open access so we don't believe in any copyright so thank you doctor uh, is anybody want to say something or share something some experience regarding this is everything fine we can close the lecture today's lecture and uh, yeah we have yes dr sasidhar you want to say something in the last uh, no 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 i just want to thank you all for your uh, participation and uh, please feel free to email me and like dr hasrat said uh, all the details are available on the web page and uh, i look forward to engaging with you in future for any collaborative research or any kind of productive discussions we can learn from each other so thank you very much once again and, uh, and all the best and have a great day great evening great night wherever you are in whichever part of the world thank you very thank much you. Uh, for thank the you. audience there is one one observation i have uh, come across today There's, there is some difficulty in registration in the zoom i don't think there is any difficulty just click the um click the link and you just put uh, you open the zoom you put in the zoom id then you lead, you are led to um, one platform where you have to put in your information about the i mean that is the registration process in fact and that data is stored in in the zoom where uh, which the data which we um, access late uh, after the lecture and based on that 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 is the registration data in fact of every person who is attending and i think this platform is uh, very easy to enter only only the thing that you have to register it whenever you want to enter this is also for the security reason that everybody cannot enter into the system without registering without having a, a zoom account nobody can enter so this is also for the security reason and some people are uh, facing any difficulty entering into it. probably they in my opinion they are trying to escape the system they are trying to are they lazy they may be lazy they don't want to do this exercise but this is only happening today only i have noticed today we have had already like about 10 different lectures previously so there was no such incidents has happened like today has happened some people are having the difficulty to enter and for for everything there is a difficulty without difficulty without effort uh, you you cannot achieve anything and if you are not able to do a little effort of registering yourself putting your data in then what is the use of uh, attending the lecture then you will say okay we just uh, uh, just put in the knowledge into my brain and then okay you do it so this spoon feeding is not very good No, there is no purpose then all purpose is defeated thank you so much it's not a very good uh, good observation for today thank you so much we close it uh, formally thank you dr sasidharan finally and all the audiences thank you so much thank you thank you bye bye